Hello, Andreas. Uh, so nice to see you. And thank you for your time for this interview. Wonderful, yes. Thank you so much uh, that you're ready for this video interview about uh, your fingerings uh, of the Brahms piano works. And I might uh, introduce you, Andreas. You, we are friends for so many years. And I miss you. I'm, I would love to see you live, but you know, you're in Melbourne, we are in Munich. So it's fantastic to have the chance uh, to do the video uh, Zoom interview uh, instead of live, but let's look forward to meet again in person. I would love this. So I, I, I should mention that a couple of years ago, we published a totally revised uh, new Brahms piano pieces, uh, word text edition. And uh, in 2019, also the best-selling title, uh, one of our best-selling titles of the Brahms piano sonatas, um, uh, Scherzo and Ballads, um, according to the Neue Brahms Complete Edition Gesamtausgabe. And we were very happy to, um, that you agreed to our invitation to do the, the, your fingerings to the practical edition. Thank you for this. And that's the reason why we talk today. We are curious to learn a, bit, a little bit about your ideology, about your thinking, what fingering all about. And my first question would be, um, why printed fingerings in Urtext edition? What's the reason? Um, why do you do this? Why is it helpful or, or what's the background? Well, I regard um, the, uh, the practical edition, um, some, uh, an edition which goes a bit further. Uh, and I think fingerings are, are very important. I, I would say uh, you have um, fingerings which are technically comfortable. You have fingerings which uh, support your musical ideas. And uh, you, have, you have fingerings which uh, help you to memorize the piece. And it's, it's very interesting to discuss this. And, and I think uh, every pianist has a different philosophy and fingerings are very personal, but um, uh, I really enjoy doing them uh, for the Henry Publisher and uh, to share some ideas, which of course, some of them are very personal. So Andreas, um, may I ask you, are these fingerings, which are printed now in the Handle Word Text Edition, your own, the, the ones you really play on stage? Or do you have a kind of a, um, a user in mind and you change here and there your own uh, ideas? I think it's both. Uh, of course, I, I would base them on my, on my fingerings. Uh, at the same time, I'm trying to, to balance them. You know, some of them are very personal. Uh, very idiosyncratic. It depends what uh, hand you have, uh, how your musical mind works. Uh, all that is very important uh, to, to decide um, what works uh, for you. However, when you publish fingerings, of course, you want to uh, reach out to as many pianists as possible. And, uh, and therefore, I have uh, revised every fingering I use and often I thought hmm, that's a bit personal I think I want to change that but there are other passages where um, I think I have a, a good solution uh, for a, a challenging pass passage for instance which um, which hopefully uh, will help pianists. Because your fingerings your printed fingerings and your app fingerings are in the market for a couple of years now, we receive um, comments by users, by pianists, and we discussed this, Andreas, already. There are so uh, many enthusiastic reactions by piano teachers and professional colleagues of yours, but there are also, of course, as always, because it's so subjective, uh, some uh, quite negative reactions. They, they would not accept things, especially uh, your decision to distribute some notes to between the hands, uh, um, contrary to what Brahms wrote. And uh, why, why do you do this? Why, um, what's the reason? To start with, um, of course it's divisive and, um, and people um, always uh, discuss hand chairs. Uh, that's, that's quite fair. On the other hand, I decided to, to include some of them because literally every, literally every pianist uh, who performs on stage 
use them. And I think the only time I heard someone um, being completely faithful uh, to their score, um, there was a pianist who played the, the Vandra Fantasy by Schubert, and it was, a, it was pretty disastrous. <laughs> Uh, and, and therefore, every colleague I know use extensive hand chairs, and I think that's, that's very important because we serve the music, we, we, you know, we, we are not, uh, it, it's for sheer practical reasons. Right. Uh, there are certain passages in, in the second piano concerto by Brahms where you really have to think about hand chairs, otherwise it's next to impossible to, to play that passage. Um, but I have to say, I have never met um, a, um, a pianist who is frequently performing um, on that level, uh, who said, I never mm -hmm. use any chairs. I have never met. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, uh, and I have to say, these are suggestions. So you can, um, you can decide for yourself. It's clearly marked that it is my suggestion and you can ignore them if you, if you like. Um, so that's, that is something I find always very important. I'm not saying I'm right, or this is the only way uh, to, to play that. Um, certainly not, um, but um, here is a suggestion which might be very helpful. Helpful in the, in the sense of um, practical, uh, pragmatic, um, yes. to be more precise, uh, to, yeah, to, be, yes. uh, to be safe. Uh, at least on stage, uh, if you play some things, and the Brahms uh, uh, scores are quite dense and a lot of notes to be played at the same time. Here's, for instance, uh, an example, um, the first Rhapsody over 79. Um, there is a melodic line, which is very hard to play because um, the, the chords are, you know, a big stretch. And so um, if you use, uh, your right hand uh, uh, to support the melodic line, that will be much more musical in the end. And, uh, and I think that serves a musical idea, which is more important uh, than being a purist and say, no, this is the only way to play it and there is no other way. Um, another one, which <clears throat> I thought for a while if I should use it or not, is the, uh, the first sonata in, in C major. Um, in the development section uh, of the first movement uh, is a passage where the right hand um, has a, a polyrhythmic, a very energetic passage. And, um, and I, I thought for a while whether I should uh, uh, suggest that, but to bring out um, this rhythm in a, in a, in a very um, marcato way, um, you would use the left hand um, and I think it's it's a great help to make it more characteristic, um, but obviously it's it's uh, your choice to follow that suggestion or to say no, nah, not for me. Um, and um, so these are two examples. One serves um, a very musical idea, which I think is is really important, and um, the other one is um, you know is helpful to to play that in a technically really precise way. Andreas, we have some fingering, original fingerings by Brahms. We all printed them all in, in italics, um, uh, cursive pr print. Uh, what do you think, uh, talking about the passage you showed us in the first sonata, first movement, what, oh, there's no, no Brahms fingering. What, what do you think had Brahms done? Uh, maybe he used the left hand like you, you, you did it or what do you think? What is his style of playing, his own work? Yes, I think this is a, a misconception that um, that a composer uh, would be exactly uh, writing it um, uh, in the two systems, the way um, they would play it. Mm -hmm. they, often they did it simply for practical reasons, to avoid ledger lines and what have you. Um, mm -hmm. And just wrote it in the other system, um, and and I think Brahms fingerings are very interesting, very idiosyncratic, and um, yeah, I say a little old-fashioned. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is um, it is something which was also described the way he played the piano, and uh, um, uh, was 
very special and um there is there are some fingerings which i try to follow and i was always struggling and and then i even um spoke to colleagues and i said gosh you know that's really a, quite a um quite a difficult passage to play oh. until i thought hmm let's let's try another fingering and here's one example and that's from the um uh, from uh, uh, the Opus 116, number two, and you can see it. And, and here um, I make a further suggestion, adding to, to Brahms's fingering, which I think for me all of a sudden made it much easier um, to play uh, uh, this passage. So, um, and then I was very happy to, you know, when I talked to colleagues and said, Oh my God! You know that was <laughs> that was so helpful, and I think it's absolutely fine not to use Brahms's fingering. Again, I'm sure he would have um, suggest he he would um, make a suggestion and say, "Look, use it or or leave it." Um. <laughs> so, talking about hands, we all know that uh, we are individuals. We have all different shape of hands. What's the perfect in your? Uh, dear, the perfect pianist hand. How does it look? Yes, I, I think fingers, um, contrary to common belief, should not be too long. Um, they, you know, the, the hand itself, um, the palm should be powerful because that's that's where the strength comes from, and um, and hands should be very flexible. So, um, I uh, I know some students they have. Uh, pretty big hands but they're not very flexible and and they still find it hard to to um to play certain chords whilst others with smaller hands uh would not have that problem um so th it's something very individual very personal and um and, and therefore you you cannot make everyone happy basically no. um but um uh I would say there are certain common grounds which you know I'm trying to use a lot, and I think this is this is good um, when it when it comes to uh, to a publication. I also find it interesting that you have also fingerings um, which would fit a, a musical temperament. So some people find it very important that. Um, the fingering would support their memorizing process. Mm -hmm. So they would um, uh, find it easier to memorize a passage with a certain fingering. Other people say, I don't have a problem. I just need a technically comfortable fingering. Um, and, um, and I would often try to find a fingering, which is not the most comfortable, but the most musical one, which would you know, bring out a, a melody and or, or or you know, make sure that that you have that legato line or you don't lose uh, lose the bass or you know all this um, and and even if it's a if it's a less comfortable fingering um, or a more controversial one, if it serves a musical idea, mm -hmm. I would use. Talking about comfortness, comfortability. Um, what about the tempo? I mean, and the memorizing thing. I, I think sometimes um, in a, you know in a, in a slow tempo, if you really want to bring the music into your fingers first, you have a slow. You choose a slow tempo, and it may be not the best fingering in the original tempo. If it's a fast tempo, what what is your approach to this aspect? Yes, you would you would sometimes have fingerings which work beautifully when you play that passage in a slow tempo, the moment you speed it up, it starts to get challenging. And, um, and this is, uh, you know, interesting. You, you might also have a few uh, uh, fingerings in, in uh, our edition, which um, you would go, oh, that's unusual. And I would say, well, just wait until you have to speed up <laughs> that, that uh, passage. And all of a sudden you would you would notice, ah, this is why it works, because it really works when you when you play it in a fast speed. Thank you very much. Um, 
you've recorded the complete piano works of Johannes Brahms yourself. So may I ask, is it a long, long love story between you and Brahms or how, how is your approach to this huge repertoire? I always loved Brahms. Um, I remember when I was a child, I, I uh, and the first time I heard actually his piano works, um, I was completely fascinated by it. Um, and I have to say, um, I'm also astonished that um, not many people actually perform the complete works by Brahms, um, which I find uh, surprising. Um, and, um, and I thought, yeah, that's, that's possibly something I want to do. And I have to say, um, to learn, perform and, um, and think about all the works uh, gives you a broader perspective. And you, you also start to understand or get a deeper understanding um, of his, of his uh, compositional output. Andreas, the, the surprising or not so surprising thing uh, with Brahms is that's his first opus, the first work he really um, published, uh, dedicated to Josef Joachim, is so connected, as you said before, to uh, Robert Schumann and his circle. And he was uh, a, a, young, um, a young pianist composer himself. So uh, when he started uh, publishing his uh, works, it was piano solo work. I mean, the opus one is C major sonata, is, 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 is incredibly difficult to play, uh, hard to play. And may I ask you if it, um, it, 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 does it make a difference for you if you play this as a young pianist, the, the, you know, the repertoire of the young prosperous um, Johannes or the very late, the latest works, the, the intermezzi, et cetera, uh, um, being a young person or an old person, does it make a difference you know, what's your experience with Brahms over the years? That's an interesting question. I think um, it has advantages both ways. So if you, if you talk about um, uh, the sonatas, for instance, um, of course, um, you, you, you have to be a young spirit. Um, it is so Sturm und Drang yes. and uh, it's wonderful. But uh, I think a student would benefit enormously uh, when uh, they would play the late works as well. Mm -hmm. um, Opus 116, 17, 18, 19, um, um, because it's a different um, approach and to get actually the, his, his, um, his compositional ideas and how they develop and and also the intimacy of, of the pieces which you can't you can't just um, um, reveal with a melody and just some accompaniment underneath that is not Brahms not even in his early works um, but um, uh, I think it's it's also absolutely marvelous if you have um, an older pianist who plays um, some of the great virtuosic um, uh, pieces. And I, I think, you know, take the Paganini variations. Yeah? Um, I noticed that um, one or two performances, they were so perfect that they were not even exciting anymore. <laughs> um, and uh, you want to have someone who also struggles and, you know, it has to be an Olympic fight here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, and yes, and they're so inventive as well. And it's not just the virtuosity for the sake of fast notes and, and fast passages. It's actually uh, the sound, the sound world he develops. And um, so, he never, Brahms, he never composes a piece uh, for the sake of being virtuosic. I think you have the full range from the early to the late, um, and there's so much to discover, and, uh, and I think all ages will benefit from it. And thank you very much indeed for the wonderful explanation. Um, you said revolutionary, I have to think about this. So yes. Andrea, Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful talk and let's hope 
that many, many uh, pianists um, will find it very helpful to have your fingerings and your suggestions uh, to perform these works from Opus 1 to Opus 119 uh, uh, together with the Handel Urtext edition. Andrea, thank you very much for your time and have a good night um, and uh, hope to see you again very soon. No, thank you very much. That's um, really wonderful to talk and um, it's, it's really wonderful to be associated uh, with the Handel Publishers.